Welcome to Corwin's Leaders Coaching Leaders Podcast with host Peter DeWitt. This podcast is from education leaders for education leaders. Every week, Peter and our guests get together to share ideas, put research into practice, and ensure every student is learning, not by chance, but by design. Hey, Ariel. Happy Monday. Yeah. Hi, Peter. Our last episode of the season of season two from surviving to thriving. Well, this was a, this was a really good way to end it. A conversation with Mark White. Um, he offered up so many interesting ideas to me. And, you know, one of the things is that when he was talking about these different ideas, I could see the different researchers that would come with it and the different kind of conversations from, maybe like a conceptual understanding, the passion projects and those things, but it's just a really, I don't even know how to say, I hate saying it's an interesting idea because it's a reality that we're all in. And with having different generations within the workforce of schools and what that means from a technological space, what it means from a professional learning space, Mm -hmm. what it means as uh, for teaching our students and what does it mean for school leadership? And I'm glad we were able to get into all that here. Yeah, definitely. Mark White is, um, for those of you who don't know, the author of Five Gen Leadership. He's also a co-author on the book, Leading Schools in Disruptive Times, which uh, we interviewed his co-author, Dwight Carter, in our first season of the podcast. Um, And so now, you know, today it's a great opportunity to talk to Mark White about this new book, Five Gen Leadership. And Mark is a former teacher, principal, and superintendent who writes and consults in schools across America. America, and he's constantly searching for what's next in education. And you will definitely hear that in this interview. You can tell he has this fantastic macro view of what has come before and what's coming, you know, in the next decade for schools. So I think every school leader is going to really enjoy hearing this. Yeah. So I hope they enjoy the, uh, the podcast as much as I enjoyed interviewing Mark. So Mark White, welcome to the Leaders Coaching Leaders podcast. It's so good to have you here. Well, thank you. It's nice to be here. Thanks for having me. You, uh, I have to admit, you have some really great ideas for books. Last uh, last season, we interviewed one of your co-authors, Dwight Carter, and we talked about you know the whole idea of disruptive um, leadership. And now you're here, and, and we're going to talk a little bit about this whole idea of five-gen leadership, which to me is a really interesting idea because, or maybe I should say it's a really interesting reality, uh, <laughs> because when I, you know, when I was a principal, I had a lot of veteran staff, and I was a younger principal, but as I've gotten older, I'm realizing, oh, wait a second, I'm one of the, I'm starting to be one of the older guys, and there are much younger people that are that are working in the school. Why is this such an important topic? I, I think it's important because we've never had such big gaps between our senior leadership at times and our younger teachers, and between our older teachers and our younger teachers. And many times our views of the world are shaped by our growth experiences. And these four generations, the boomers, the Gen Xers, uh, the millennials, the Gen Zers, and by the way, we now have Gen Z in our teaching staffs. Those teachers under the age of 25 or 26, a lot of leaders don't under, don't realize yet that they are in our staffs. Um, we, they've all all these generations have grown up differently, and so that shapes how we view the world, view each other, even view our teaching. So we have to know the generations and recognize these gaps and try to bridge these gaps. You know, as a as a fellow writer, I know that there are just things that trigger sort of trigger our ideas, right? Trigger that creative process where we're like, I want to explore that more. How did this all come about for you? Um, what was sort of, did you have an aha moment or was it just something that you started to notice and you were thinking, you know what, I need to go a little bit deeper with this? I, I had one of the biggest aha moments of my entire career. Uh, I have been fortunately the last four or five years training thousands of teachers and educators around America. And I was training a group of about 40 elementary teachers. I'd asked them to do this exercise. I broke them up by generations. I had them talk about the technology that changed their lives because it's technology that's making us so different in these generations. Okay? It's driving the change. And so there are a lot of aha moments in there. The, the boomers talked about 
getting uh, cable television, you know, or uh, getting a color television. And a lot of our younger teachers had no idea that, what, you didn't have color? And then all the way to Gen Z growing up with YouTube and the internet, right? And so at the end of this exercise, I asked these three young Gen Z teachers, all of them 23, 24 years old, in the middle of the entire group. They're the newbies. I said, okay, let me, let me put you on the spot. If you could tell your trainers, the people doing the PD, something to change to help you, what would it be? And one of them spoke up and said, I would tell them, just tell us what to do and leave us alone. Let us go do it. And I thought, oh my gosh. And everybody started laughing. And I, I feel like it sort of stuck a uh, Gen Z knife into my boomer heart there, you know? Um, but but that, that struck me because that's the, that's the figure it out generation. I mean, when they get their phones, when they get these new video games, they don't read directions on how to do it. They just go figure it out. Whereas people like me, a boomer, baby boomer growing up, um, I wanted people to show me what to do step by step. Where are my written directions? And that's the way we still view the world in PD. You know, our boomers and our Xers, the next generation, often want to be shown step by step. The millennials, the Gen Zers, just kind of show us some of it and turn us loose. Let us go figure it out. Does that, when you're, when you're talking about that, does that sort of open up the idea that one generation might be more compliant than the other generation? Like if you're a school leader, <laughs> why is this so important to know? Because when I'm hearing you say that the step-by-step, -step, I'm somewhere in between. I'm, uh, I like to try to figure things out on my own, but I'm also yes. a bit of a rule follower. So I'm sort of like in that middle stage. Is it important for leaders to know this because you might have certain people that are going to be really maybe compliant and I realize we're generalizing here. And then other people that just, want to be left alone to figure it out on their own? Like, what does that mean for school leaders? Yeah, I think it's really important for leaders to understand this about the generations. The boomers who were born from 1946 to 64 and the Gen Xers from 1965 to around 1980 are much more compliant, fall into line, follow, follow the leader, follow the authority. The younger teachers, the millennials and Gen Zers question the status quo. It's what they do. They're going to they want to be team team members. They want to get along, but they want to know why they're doing something. Um, they're not going to, in the evaluations, for example, evaluations, as I, as I do my evaluations of teachers and my coaching, I've noticed that the older teachers tend to say, okay, how did I do? They want to know. Uh, they want to survive it, okay? The Gen Z and the millennials have to know how they did. They want to hear about it. They want to hear uh, did I do okay? They, they practically run down the hall to tackle me because they want to be coached. They want to know what's going on. I, I would say that as you approach evaluations, as you approach new initiatives, you have to understand that they are going to question more the younger ones about what you're doing and why you're doing it. They will do it, but they have to see the reason for doing it. I, I remember, uh, so I used to be an adjunct professor here in Albany, New York, and um, I had, when I was an adjunct, I had the students bring in their laptops, their tablets. Tablets were fairly new back then. Mm -hmm. And I remember, um, and of course, because I was an adjunct, I got the worst slot for a course, right? It was like 7.15 to 9.45 past my bedtime. And one <laughs> of the things, I remember walking into class and a couple of the students were there and I heard a, a student say, this class is so different because he wants us to bring our laptop, but the professor before tells us that we shouldn't be able to bring our computers. And I even, for, you know, for the blog I write for Ed Week, I've actually gotten into this and I've seen some really horrific comments from college professors that say, we don't allow our students to bring tablets. We don't allow our students to bring laptops. And this is within the past year and a half, two years. Wow. So I'm not talking about, you know, 10 years ago. Do you think that, um, do you think that this is something that, what I worry about is if university professors have that kind of philosophy, how does that impact the younger generation that are coming in to teach? Are they going to, like, are we going to um, uninspire them out of it? Like, are they going to be more likely to want to leave us because we don't get it? You know, it seems like this is a, a pretty big critical issue for us. 
Well, yeah. Well, as a matter of fact, we have fewer people going into education preparation programs than ever. Uh, we have more teachers leaving than ever. And most of, mo most more people left in 2018, the last data I saw, left the profession than ever. Most of them were millennials. Um, they want to use technology. I, I tell teachers this all the time. Um, if, if you can be a great teacher and never use technology, but you can never be the greatest you can be until you let your students use technology because that's where our kids are coming from. I mean, they're, they're taking something vital away from these kids. Kids perk up when in the K through 12 air arena. In, in the universities, the same way. You can't ask them to shut down when they walk in. That's not who they are. And I, I've, I've used it enough. I mean, boom, as a boomer, I use a lot of apps in my training and I see the efficiency of what it can do for training and teaching. And so I think the professors who are doing that they're, they're part of that old, they're part on the other side of this digital generation gap, I call it. A lot of our, and I want to say this too, of course, like you said, uh, you know, every generation is going to have outliers. I'm not all boomer. Sometimes I'm Gen Z. One characteristic or one group of characteristics doesn't, doesn't always fit every person in that age group. The teachers who are older, the boomers like me who have adapted to the technology, they're doing much better than their boomer peers who have not. And the COVID crisis, the shutdown really exposed that. I, I talk about the tale of two students. You could have two students in classrooms side by side. And if one teacher is using technology really well, knowing how to work in digital tools, knowing how to work in Mentimeter or using uh, a, a Jamboard or something like that, and another teacher does not, the students in the classroom that are getting the technology are gonna be probably outperforming those who are not. They're having a much better experience. When the school shut down, those teachers who were already using technology jumped right into it. The others struggled. We can no longer tell, let our teachers get by and say, well, that's for the younger teachers, I do it differently. No one can really tell the professors that, but they are doing their students, in my opinion, a disservice, not if they don't let them use technology. You know, yeah, it reminds me, I read a recent study, Pricewaterhouse and Cooper did a study back in 2019 that showed um, of all the teachers surveyed, 90% of teachers said they could not use technology to offer deeper level learning wow. to students. So um, I was, and I wanted to ask you, has COVID changed that? Because yeah, you know, you mentioned mm -hmm. Mentimeter. It's funny, I, when I was running webinars two years ago, uh, Mentimeter contacted me and asked me if I would start using their tool. And um, I remember using it once or twice and I was like, yeah, I don't use that many webinars. And then of course, you know, COVID yeah. happens. <laughs> yeah. And I've used Mentimeter during every webinar that I can. And I just, I wonder, do you, th do you think that some of that has changed just because of the pressure of COVID? Or do you think that's where we saw it? Because I think about things like self-efficacy, is that where people either boosted their confidence or they just completely lost confidence and they were like, I'm done. I think it's changed. I, I've heard from all these teachers who tell me they'll never be the same in terms of going back and using more technology and face-to-face -face instruction. Um, what I saw interestingly is, you know, when it first shut down in the spring a year ago, there was a lot of paper packets going out and then they rushed to get the Chromebooks and hotspots out to everybody. So then the school year started and people started learning how to put their lessons online. So the people who are really technology strong were able to keep adjusting throughout the year. The teachers who barely got into technology just knowing how to put their lessons online did not do a lot of adjusting during the year. And so the teachers who used technology initially uh, before all this happened kept growing and those who did not just survived and what I saw over and over again, if you don't present your lessons differently online, if you don't change them up from the face to face, it's not going to work very well. That's what I, and I wanted to ask you, I actually, uh, I had written a blog uh, right after the pandemic called Six Reasons Students Aren't Showing Up Online. And it gave me the opportunity to actually survey students. And it was pretty interesting because I had hundreds of students um, from US, Canada, and they were K-12. Uh, K-2 students, you know, notified me their parents had helped them with the survey. But one of the overwhelming things, and this is what I actually bring up to audiences when I'm running a workshop, is 
that I brought up to the audience that um, the least favorite lessons on the part of students were ones where teachers talk too much oh, yeah. or that the PowerPoint slides were too long and, or, um, you know, they had to do packets and you kind of sit back and you're like, yes, you can talk and say this happened during COVID, but the reality is we know that that happened well before COVID. The mm -hmm. favorite lessons of students were the ones where the teachers didn't talk so much. Um, so maybe they had teacher clarity, but they only spent 10 or 15 minutes and then they allowed students to go into collaborative activities. So when you just brought up that point, I think that's one of the, that's one of the challenges, right? Because I think the knee jerk reaction on the part of people, especially when they're not comfortable using technology is to say, okay, now I'm going to use technology, but I'm going to do it the same way that I run a classroom and I'm really going to control, I'm going to control yeah. the situation. How do you, how does a leader help? help teachers find the balance between letting go of some of that control, giving it to students, because what I also wonder, and I realize this is a really long question, but you got me thinking, you know, you're talking about a generation that wants to figure it out on their own, but one of the things we saw during COVID with this much younger generation of students is that when they were on their own, they struggled with figuring it out on their own because they were so right. used to somebody sort of telling them what to do. How do you find a balance with all that as a school leader? That is the art of teaching. That really is. You're right. You know, sometimes some of the older teachers might say, Mark, these kids are still the same. They're still kids. I said, yes, they are kids. They need guidance. They need some supervision. They need you helping them learn. Uh, but they're very different. Their brains are even developing differently because of their interaction with all the technology. So I would say that you have to use the technology at the right time. If you're just using the technology, like you said, to control the learning, that's not going to work as well. These kids are used to exploring on their own. When they play a video game, and by the way, we have Gen Alpha in our elementary schools up to about fifth grade now, slightly different generations than Gen Z. When we have Gen Z in the secondary levels, when all these kids play video games, they are exploring. They're having to find ways to stay alive in the game. Whenever they are on the internet, they are exploring things that uh, pertain to them, that are inter interest them. So they want to control a lot more of their learning than previous generations. Now, one good thing I'm seeing in a lot of the teacher appraisal instruments around the states, to get to the highest level many times, you have to turn the learning over to the student more frequently. You don't do it all the time. I mean, there's still need for direct instruction. That's what, see, the kids were missing sometimes a direct instruction. And here's what we really missed. So many times students learn in a classroom when they turn and talk to somebody next to them. When the teachers are helping somebody over there, they'll turn to somebody and say, what answer did you get and how did you get that? We couldn't do that this year. And that's one reason they struggled. We lost a lot of learning because the kids were not interacting with each other. I, I actually, when I was reading the book, one of the things that you taught me, because I feel like, so I'm Gen X, and I knew baby boomers, new Gen X, you know, you know, Gen Z, but all these new generations that are happening, which also kind of depressed me and made me feel a little bit older when I was there. But you said one of the chapters in the book is called The Impact of the Silent Generation and Gen mm -hmm. Alpha. Why, what, what is that about, and, and why did you write about that? Yeah, I thought that I had to pay homage to the silent generation. Uh, we can't leave them out. They formed a lot of the schools we have today, uh, a lot of the good things we have in our schools. You know, uh, they were very strong people. Um, they raised me. They raised the boomers. Um, and I felt like that the concept of the open classroom, the idea of integration, of trying to open the door for more female and minority leaders, that all started going on with them. And that is still, their ideas are still with us because we run our schools as if still, as if they're 20th century schools. I mean, we still run the same calendar. We still have some of the same testing. The standards have been upgraded a little bit, not enough. Um, so I wanted them on as a bookend and that this chapter comes early in the book, but the alphas, the ones who are, have been born since about 2011, uh, those kids in our elementary schools, the up agers they're called. And by the way, they got that name Alpha from Mark McCrindle, a researcher in New, Ze in New Zealand. And in 2011 is when the iPad came out. And that's when this generation started. Alpha is the beginning. Uh, this will be the first generation to live to 2100 in mass. Okay. Um, we, we can't look at our education 
the, the silent generation could look at education because the rate of change was so much slower. And they could kind of say, okay, we'll be doing this another 10, 15, 20 years probably, right? No more. We have to look at, gener at education as not just something today and through 2025. If these kids are gonna be active in 2050, 2060, 2070, 2080, 2090, we cannot predict what the world is going to be like, but very, very different. But we do have to make sure that we're looking at our standards, looking at our curriculum, and not just having them memorized too much. Too many teachers still use silent generation ideas of a lot of memorization. A lot of parents still think, oh, that's an educated person. An educated person is going to be those who can think, can work at the upper end of Bloom's taxonomy, can analyze, evaluate, and create moving forward. Because their whole lives, you know, a lot, there's a uh, survey of Gen Z professionals found that uh, at least they know that 40% of the jobs that they'll be having in the future are not here yet. I mean, it might be greater than that. See, so and they even changed up, you know, Bloom's taxonomy went from evaluation at the top to creativity because no longer enough just to evaluate. Now you have to create. You have to say, okay, now I made the evaluation. What am I going to do about it to survive? And we have to realize what AI is going to do, artificial intelligence to teaching, or what's going to be happening in 2050, 2060, 2070. But when these kids are growing up, they're not going to look back and remember their test scores. They're going to look back and try to remember, did that teacher teach me how to think? Well, that's what I'm. That's what I'm hoping for sure, because uh, we could we could have a long conversation on test scores alone. Yes. Yes. Uh, you know, you just mentioned moving away from evaluation, and I thought. Um, what I appreciate that you looked at is going from moving from managing to coaching. Right. And so I read, I read a study, it came out, a, a couple, it just came out recently actually, but NASSP EPI looked and said 42% of principals are considering leaving their position. Mm -hmm. And we know that over the past 15 years, there's been an increase in workload. You mentioned tests. So we're talking about accountability we're talking NCLB when that first started, you know, we were, you and I were both in education during that time. We remember when that happened. How is it that, um, how is it that a school leader knowing that they are seeing this increase in workload at the same time, they're supposed to move from management, which we probably easier to mm -hmm. coaching, which puts them in a realm of an area that maybe they're not feeling very efficacious about because they're not feeling confident. When you, when you wrote about moving from managing to coaching, obviously you took all those things into consideration. How do they do that given all the demands of the job? Yeah, it's, it's never been harder. And what you're talking about really led to the second book, Leading Schools in Disruptive Times, because I started my teaching back in the 80s, my leadership really in the 80s and 90s. And I've seen all the stuff that's just been piled on our plates and nothing is ever taken away. They just keep adding to it. I would say that we have to have new ways of doing things. We have to understand the building leaders can't be responsible for everything. They need help. We need distributive leadership more than ever. And we have to remember too, that we are in transition, okay? We still have a lot of our boomers and Gen Xers leading our school districts. By 2030, our youngest boomer will be 66 years old. Most will be out of the business. A lot of Gen Xers will be retired by then. We'll have a lot more millennial superintendents and millennials and Gen Xers in the district offices. We'll have a lot of buildings being led by millennials and Gen Zers, okay, at the campus level. That said, they bring a different way of looking at the world. They, they use technology more frequently. They won't be averse to using it. They won't, they'll be pushing it. Um, I'm hoping, and, 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 and they don't accept the status quo. They push back. That's a good thing. The younger teachers, Gen Z and Gen X, really plug into purposes and mission. If we're going to recruit them and retain them, we have to talk about our mission, not just our test scores. What happens when people go into interview, principals often say, look at our test scores, they're really good. Yes, young teachers are competitive, but they want to be a part of something that's gonna change people's lives. Put all that together. What I hope is that they are the ones getting the guidance from our boomers and Gen Xers who really weather the storm of change that is coming in the next 10 years. And I call the book Leading Schools in the 2020s as part of the subtitle, because I think we're going through in the next 10 years, a huge change in our schools. We all talk about how COVID has spread that up. We're seeing new models. 
By the way, let's not forget that a lot of these kids coming in are going to have millennial and Gen Z parents. Mm -hmm. So it's not just the teacher C. I mean, and Gen Beta, if they still call them that in 2026, will be pre-K and K in 2030. And so it's going to be a different world. They're not going to tolerate, I think, some of the high stakes testing that's going on. They're not going to tolerate the school days, maybe these school years. Uh, we're going to see a lot of shaking out in the next year and a half after COVID. And I think the millennials and Gen Zers with their adaptive, uh, not accepting the status quo mentality are going to be positioned to really lead us through that. And I, I, uh, I, I'm optimistic about where we're going. I, I question also, uh, and, and let's look at AI, I question how many teachers we'll have in the future in our public schools. Will our public schools adapt quickly enough? Because as former superintendent, nothing against my board. I mean, we're, we were a good district. We were very progressive, uh, but I know that Politics comes into play many times in school boards. Parents, uh, school board members often don't understand new ways of doing things. And the parents are going to demand change. I think that might come faster than we take it, take it to them. So it's going to be very interesting the next 10 years with the transitional generational change, with the changes coming with AI, uh, with the new types of kids coming in. I, I don't see, I just don't see how our testing model, and I have nothing against accountability, but I don't see how the current testing model will survive by 2030. Well, I hope it's gonna be gone a lot sooner than that because we know that, I mean, as a principal, we would get the results five months after the kids took the test when they were in a different grade level. So it wasn't really giving us a lot of information. What I was also thinking, and as you were talking is, I think we're gonna see a lot of changes in the next few months too, because I wrote a blog in the fall about, um, because what we know is student, and then we actually just did a study on this that they released in the last week. We have hundreds of thousands of students that are leaving the public school system. Mm -hmm. And one of yep. the things that I wrote about is that when we're dealing with budgetary stuff, something you and I have both had to deal with over our tenure in, in schools, when we're dealing with budget stuff, and then we're also dealing with um, trying to be competitive because the online industry was increasing rapidly well before COVID. That what, what we started, what I wrote about was, would it be possible for schools to actually create their own um, remote learning school within their public school system? And I have to admit, I've heard from people that are, are doing that. In the fall, I've, I've heard from principals that I work with that are actually going to be in charge of the remote school because their district decided to do that. So I think there are already some, we're starting to see these changes where people were saying, I hate remote learning, can't wait to get back into the classroom. There were districts that said, hold on now. There were kids that actually did mm -hmm. well and we can find the hybrid right. part where the kids are maybe doing remote learning during the day, but they're still playing sports with everybody in person. Like, I think you're starting to see some of that now. And I think that that could be some exciting changes for public schools too. Have you, has that been your experience too? Oh yeah, every superintendent I know is scared to death not knowing how many kids are gonna show up for school next year. Yeah. Because if you lose 10 to 15% of your students to a hybrid model that you're not offering, that's funding and you're overstaffed by 10 to 15%. Uh, the, the future is going to be choice, choice, choice. Hybrid after hybrid after hybrid. And the silent generation for the boomers and Gen Xers fall in line, here's a school day, here's a testing, this is what we do. This, these generations today are questioning that. No, there have to be other ways of doing this. I can see a lot of people coming back next year and, and I, I say, okay, we're gonna have a lot of kumbaya moments if school, if school opens up as normal. Right. With the variants, who knows now, right, for young kids. But I can see a lot of kumbaya moments, we get back into it, a lot of people wanna be, be back. But then after about two weeks, they're gonna be saying, hold on, I'm here every day. Can't we do like a flex Friday or something or do something different for interventions on Fridays or, or do something different? I can see some parents, especially at the secondary level. My goodness, high schools will never be the same again. You cannot run a high school the way I ran a high school even back in the early 2000s. I mean, you've got to give choices like you said, you know, like why can't juniors and seniors, especially the more mature kids, the more mobile kids, why can't they do some of their courses at home? and then come in in the afternoon for afternoon courses and go do their extracurriculars like they would do in college or something like that. Do internships. And exactly. That, that yeah. kind of stuff. And, and see, back to the accountability piece, like I said, I, I'm not opposed to accountability. We all need to be accountable. But the idea of doing a multiple choice 
short writing tests, those days have to be gone. We, we should be into projects for these kids. Let the Gen Z and Gen Alpha kids, give them a, a project where they have to take control of it, where they have to use technology, where they have to make a presentation about something they care about. And then let them pull all these things together and show you what they can do. That's where we ought to be going. And that's where we're going to have to be. And if we don't do it, some other model is going to do it. Yeah, it, it last, last year I uh, was putting together a panel um, with an organization of students and there were probably, let's say 10 students and they came from five different countries. They all had passion projects, which is what you're talking about, right? One was, uh, you know, very involved in the environment. One was very involved with Black Lives Matter. You know, these, these very big projects. And I asked them, so how do you get the support to do this at school? And most of them said they don't. And I found that to be really wow. sad. Like I just, I felt really, yeah. and it's, it's not that teachers aren't, you know, helping out in certain ways, but from a very intentional, purposeful focus, the students didn't feel like their schools were supporting them. It was school and this is what I'm doing outside of school. And I just, much of what you're talking about is where can we bring that in to the conceptual part to say, this is what we have to learn about. Now, what is this going to look like? And that's where the projects come in too, which I think can be very powerful. Mark, I could talk to you for hours and hours. Um, <laughs> calling it an interesting book is really just actually not fair. Uh, five generation, five gen leadership is, is a really important book. Um, when I was reading, I, I, I gained so much by reading Thank through you. it. And I think what you've put together here is just, there's so many lessons for school leaders, for teachers to be able to develop. And as much as we talk about, you know, by 2030, I think what you offer in the book is something that isn't just about 2030, it's about they can read it now and put some of these things into practice right away. So I wanna thank you for being on the Leaders Coaching Leaders podcast and uh, also for putting together some, some really fantastic books. Well, thank you. It's uh, great talking with you also. Uh, I, I, I enjoyed writing the book. Um, I learned a lot writing it also, as you know, when, you, when we write, we reflect. And so uh, I hope it helps people out there make this transition through this decade. I definitely think it will. So thank you again, Mark. Thank you. So Ariel, one of the things that I enjoyed about talking to Mark is not only, you know, one of those interviews where I've done a lot of interviews, podcasts, you know, a seat at the table. And sometimes you're like, oh, gosh, we still have like five or 10 minutes. Um, but with Mark, I could have asked 30 more questions. And what I really appreciate, and it was so clear from the interview, is what he said, as a writer, you write something that you want to learn about. And, and that's what I want school leaders and teachers to take away from the interview, but also if they if they pick up the book, it's to go in as a learner. To go, don't be don't be offended if you're not doing some of the things he's talking about. Don't be. It's easy to be offended if you're like, wait a second, I'm Gen X and I don't look at it that way. Go in as a learner and think about what are some things that I can do differently, knowing that our students do need something differently because technology has advanced so much and what they have access to in many cases has changed so much that we can't limit their access because they have so much of it outside of school. So what yeah. about you? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I love that that learner focus. I think you have to take with millennials and Gen Z, especially. And I love that he just reinforced, you know, Gen Z is already here. They're in your classrooms, in your schools. They're coming. You need to figure out how to work with them and, you know, lead them in professional learning and everything. And I, I really liked when he said that millennials and Gen, Gen Z are positioned well to help lead education after all of the disruptions of COVID. Um, I think we can't, you know, we can't afford to miss out on, on the genius and the contributions that they have to share. So I think this is so important and, and obviously also, you know, capitalizing on the genius of our boomers and Gen X teachers as well. So, yeah, I, I think this is, you know, so important for all school leaders who are listening and so important as we head into, you know, the rest of this school year and the rest of this decade, the 2020s. 
I, I think that this is one of those interviews that when I walk away, I'm as a as a person who runs professional learning and development, I try to include technology as much as possible, especially when we have access to it. But still, I think it's going to make me look at um, the attendees in a different way and say, am I am I giving them what they need enough? as opposed to, am I still using an old model? I just happen to be using Mentimeter at the same time. So definitely a really fantastic, uh, definitely fantastic interview that I'm gonna think about for a while. Yeah, yeah, and I hope that listeners do as well. And this concludes our second season of Leaders Coaching Leaders. It has been another fantastic season. We get to talk to so many amazing people. Well, thank you, Ariel. Always good to work with you as always, but thank you to everybody who who listened to the podcast over the season as well. That's right. I hope you take care and we will see you later. 